Hi, I'm Representative Linda Schlegel-Culver, representing the 108th District, Northumberland and Snyder Counties. We are here in Northumberland County at K. Schlegel Fruit Farms, and with me today I have Ken Schlegel, Carl Schlegel, and Betsy Schlegel. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, the history of the farm and uh, the different varieties of fruits that they grow and uh, some best management practices here on the farm. So, Ken, can you tell me a little bit about the history of the farm, when it started, um, and how it grew? Well, my dad lived in Sunbury and he got fired off the uh, railroad company. There was a, there was a depression on it. Huh? They, moved, they moved down here and bought 27, I think it was. 1927? And, and there were 17 acres to this original plot here. And that's what they had. A, they kept about 100 chickens over there. That's what they lived from for a year or two. And we started in building more chicken houses originally and also adding some fruit to the orchard, but not too much. To what was the first fruit? Peaches, actually. Peaches, Peaches mixed in with apple trees. Okay. That's about the way it was then. So, I guess in about, was it, when did you start helping? 70, in the 70s. 70s. Yeah. Well, we were up to 10,000 chickens at one time, yeah. But I was also planting more out trees, and finally we got the whole farm and trees and got out of the chicken business. Did you enlarge the acreage at any point? Then we added about 65 more acres to the farm, yes. And I don't know what day that was. That was before you guys were here. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say it was in the, I think it was around in the 50s, I believe, we added more. Then we also farmed grain, so I kept planting more fruit trees and it's all on fruit trees from that home. Now. And I'm glad it is. I think a lot of people who live around here are glad that it is. And then, I don't know, I guess it was in 65, he decided he wants to be a farmer, so he took over. Yeah. Oh, 98. Well, I was 65 years old, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. yeah, that's how it was. So you got involved in 1998? He sort of grew up in it, you might say. Right, right. Well, I, um, I've been in, uh, involved in it since little on, little on up. Um, he handed the farm over in 98. And, uh, but uh, we all still uh, had our say in, you know, what we should do and stuff. So, uh, yeah. Have you seen a lot of changes since y your dad ran it? Oh yeah, to when you ran it. The trees, when uh, when probably when he started out, they were probably thirty foot high, and now to these days they're probably ten to twelve foot high. The spacings are as close as three feet apart, so that's one of the biggest changes. Um, the trees are a smaller tree, uh, easier to manage, easier to to get into to pick. Uh, you don't need a um, 30 foot extension ladder anymore. You can do it with a smaller step ladder. So, yeah. And then, is it just a family operation or do you employ other people from the, uh, around the area? We employ, um, well, I think we right now we have four full time employees. And then throughout the year, we hire uh, part time, uh, maybe as many as, I don't know, maybe 10 to 15 part time help. Uh, but still, my family. Uh, my two sons and uh, daughter, we pick all the peaches, all the stone fruit. Okay. We only hire people to help pick uh, our apples. Why is that? There's too many to come off at one time. Okay. The peaches we have spread out, um, we can manage ourselves. But when in the fall, when the apples start coming, uh, well, our bigger acreage isn't apples. So it takes uh, more people to help harvest those in a shorter amount of time, so. So then you guys decided you were gonna start your family, uh, and then things started to change around the farm a little bit after you guys started having children, is that correct? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, they did. Um, 
uh, having living right here and having you know the children right in proximity of the orchard or home etc I was a little concerned sometimes about the spraying and that sort of thing so um I started just kind of look into it just making sure that we were safe with some different things and I guess you know some of the things I wasn't feeling that good about after I realized that you know some of the research on it might not have been that positive as in having maybe some bad effects on humans or whatever so um um, that always kind of was in the back of my mind since we were so close to, you know, living right beside the orchard. Um, but the other uh, parts that concern me, well, actually, we did make a change in our growing practices. Um, I know when Ken had, you know, the operation, he was farming it. Um, there wasn't a lot of new information out there. Um, you know, the recommendations for growing fruit, etc., was um, pretty much from Penn State. And um, the chemistries that they use to control um, insects and that sort of thing was um, basically broad spectrum. Um, it was One whatever. One spray killed all. Yeah. It, it, yeah. yeah. But I, I don't know that there was a lot of different options at that time either. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the way farming was done everywhere. Um, basically, you were given a schedule and you were pretty much told when to go out and apply these things because that would be when you could expect um, different uh, bugs to be out. So whether they were there or not, you know, you just go out, put it out and hope for the best. Um, since then, um, I think maybe the environment has gotten its fill of some of this stuff in a way. I think we're maybe seeing a little more of the effects of uh, the different chemistries and stuff that have been used on farmland, not just orchards, but all farmlands. Um, maybe now there's more research, maybe there's more technology to be able to follow this. Um, but um, they're now coming out with things that are a little more targeted, which I guess would probably be the major change that we made. We've gone to integrated pest management or IPM, which is commonly how it's referred to. Um, and one of our biggest reasons for doing that was my own children. Um, we struggled with not having the best health, I guess, when they were small. Um, ear infections, a lot, <laughs> you know, and that, I guess that made me question the whole thing because we would, I'd go to the doctor and they'd say, yeah, they have an ear infection. And I would say, why? And they wouldn't answer me. There just wasn't any answer. Um, so, and, they, and then they would prescribe an antibiotic. And so we do the antibiotic, two weeks, you know, whatever, next cold comes along, you know, another ear infection. You know, so I'm back to the doctor again, and I, after a while, I just figured it wasn't worth asking why, because they weren't going to tell me. They were just going to give me another antibiotic. So I um, just started to research it myself, and just started to realize a lot of things nutritionally, and um, the different synergy that things have with each other, and not just in the body, and with my children and their growing bodies, but just in, in growing fruit and uh, just the environment. So going off of that and realizing that the nutrition in your food and the nutrition or the soil fertility, et cetera, can all be influenced for the better through, through, some, through some of these new methods and stuff um, really, really made me start to dig into it. So at that point, probably with my persuasion and pushing, <laughs> um, we continued to look for new and better ways of growing and safer ways of growing. Thank you, Ken, Carl, and Betsy for talking about the history of the farm. I'm sure a lot of people didn't know that. Um, and it's quite interesting to know how long you've been here. And now we're gonna head up into the orchard with the fourth generation to learn more about the IPMs, the orchard itself, and the product that you grow. We're here up in the apple orchard with the fourth generation of Schlegels. We have Carrie and Caleb here with us. So your mom was talking about a little earlier about the IPM practices. Do you, I think we're standing at the heart of it because we have this box here. Uh, if you could talk about that process a little bit more with me. Yeah, um, so I think she said that IPM stands for Integrated Pest Management. Um, and I'm not sure if you mentioned that it comes from, it's a philosophy that is grounded, founded in ecology. So basically, um, instead of taking just taking care of the symptoms of the bad bugs or the pests in the orchard, we're actually looking at our orchard as a whole ecosystem and we want to try and get all of the parts of the ecosystem to work um, together as naturally um, as possible. 
So integrated pest management, IPM is how we do that. And there's many facets to IPM that we use that go into the program. Um, so today we're just, I'm gonna show you um, our insect trapping and monitoring, which is right here. Okay. We're gonna talk about mating disruption, some beneficial insects, and then we're gonna talk about our reduced pesticide usage. So to start off, um, at the basis of IPM is our insect trapping and monitoring. Um, so right here, we have an insect trap. Um, and contrary to its name, trap, we're not really trapping insects to kill them, but rather to monitor them. So this is where our journey in IPM started. And I was in high school at the time, and dad kind of put me in charge of um, overseeing it <laughs> for the first few years. But basically, um, this is the trap. And inside the trap, I don't know if you'll be able to um, yeah. see, there's like a little eraser type looking thing. Um, that is a pheromone dispenser. And insects, female insects, release pheromones that attract male insects. Um, so inside of this trap, um, you also see on the front here, it says OFM, which stands for Oriental Fruit Moth, which is a specific moth that we're trapping here and trying to monitor. And um, so inside the trap is the oriental fruit moth pheromone, and that will attract oriental fruit moths. So on a weekly basis, we would go out, and inside the trap there's a sticky plate, <laughs> which is kind of hard for me to pull out holding a microphone. <laughs> but um, we would go through and we would count if we would find any moths stuck on the sticky plate. We would identify them if they were really oriental fruit moth, and then we keep track of how many we would find on a week-to-week -week basis. By doing this, we can track um, when their peak, the peak of their life cycle is, um, when they're going to be doing the most damage to the fruit, and then we could take care of them by spraying. Um, this was in the very first part of our IPM program. So just by monitoring, we were able to cut down our pesticide usage because instead of spraying on a weekly basis for pests, we would check and see if we had them first. And if we didn't have them, we if we spray. weren't catching them, we wouldn't spray. So the monitoring was the very first baby step in the IPM program. Um, and then from there, we moved on to using mating disruption, which Caleb can tell us a little bit more about. OK, thank so. you. <laughs> yeah, so Carrie was saying about the pheromone in there attracting the uh, uh, insects. In. <laughs> and uh, so. We take that idea and uh, apply it to uh, the entire orchard where we uh, have an artificial pheromone for uh, each of our major pests that we have on the uh, have in the orchard and uh, when you uh, have a pheromone on every tree it sort of creates a cloud of pheromone and uh, the insects cannot track each other through that pheromone and uh, they don't mate and uh, it really cuts down on the amount of pesticide that you have to use to uh, almost nothing in some cases um, to control that particular pest. So do you guys find that the, the pests or the insects change over time or is it typically the same kind of issue? Well, yeah. <laughs> There's always going to be your uh, major apple pests that uh, prefer apples. They come to your orchard and they're just going to be always be there. But uh, the latest and greatest pest would be the brown marmorated stink bug. And uh, that one has been tricky, but uh, we're still not breaking from IPM to control it. And uh, there's a lot of research coming out about a, uh, it's called a, I can't remember the exact name, but it's a samurai wasp. It's more a, uh, yeah, it's a parasitic wasp. It's more a, specific than a, just a samurai wasp. There's a whole bunch of different kinds. But uh, this one, uh, we'll get into the uh, brown marmorated stink bugs' eggs and parasitize them, and it'll kill, if I remember correctly, between 60 and 100 percent of the uh, eggs. And so uh, it's just another example of uh, if we were spraying our orchard and killing bugs, um, killing all the bugs non-selectively, we would be killing that wasp and uh, any chance that we could ever establish it. So uh, it's uh, we have hope that uh, it's going to become established. Is this the same stink bug we all have at our houses? Yeah. Uh, so everybody can feel your pain when it comes to these yeah. stink bugs. 
Um, so you're basically preserving the ecosystem, trying to keep the good bugs here, not disrupt it so you have a healthier fruit um, for the public. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so today it's a big commitment uh, for you guys to decide fourth generation uh, that you're going to commit to the farming uh, world. Uh, it's a big risk, as your mother says. And um, I, I marvel at when I sit down with a farmer anywhere, um, how much they have to know across a broad spectrum of topics and, and be the master of all of them. Do you want to talk about some of those things you've had to master? <laughs> well, um, where to start the list? <laughs> you need to know chemistry, agronomy, econo econo economics, <laughs> um, biology, uh, business, yeah. marketing, I mean, marketing, yeah. uh, the tax code. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then I mean, the mechanics, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mechanics. yeah. And then uh, you do all that and uh, you have the mindset of it's not, it's not really under your control what happens uh, with the weather and all that stuff anyway. So, I mean, it's, you got to know all that. And then uh, there's a, it's such an open ended with uh, what nature's going to do. So you're hoping Mother Nature cooperates on a regular yeah. basis, right? Yeah, for the most part. That's a gamble. Part, That's a gamble. <laughs> it does, but uh, there are years where uh, it's all against you, it seems. So. so, do you want to talk about? I know you have a relationship with Penn State mm -hmm. um, with this process. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So, um, 2004 is when we started looking into the IPM. Um, Mom kind of gave the background story for she wanted to make sure that we were doing things as safe and ecologically. Um, smart as possible um, and at the same time Penn State was really starting to get into IPM um, Penn State extension and we got in we were working with an entomologist at Penn State Dr. Greg Krawcheck and he really kind of took us by the hand and helped us get into IPM and um, to where we are today um, so that was 2004 we started getting into it and by 2009 we had implemented um, mating disruption on our entire orchard and we're fully implementing a lot of the advanced IPM practices so they've been a big help. Uh, Carrie or Caleb could either of you talk about maybe the negative effects that the stink bug has on the orchard? Yeah um, the, the negative effects of the stink bug mostly are just cosmetic um, on the fruit itself it's not actually harmful to the tree at all um, it's just the stink bug will land on something any surface that it lands on, the first thing it does is taste it. So um, it will land on a piece of fruit, even as it's a small developing apple, it will sting it. Um, and that puncture wound of the stink bug will actually grow with the fruit. And um, with peaches and soft fruits like that, it will end up rotting the fruit. But with apples, um, the apple will kind of heal itself with, we call it corking, is kind of what it looks like. Um, which it ends up being edible and everything and it just grows with the fruit. It's just not pretty. Right. And so, people want first, not yes. seconds. Yeah, that is the whole problem with pests basically is they're making our fruit not pretty. <laughs> so. Except for the peaches. It rots yeah. actually yep. rots the peaches. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So we look at this beautiful orchard and you just can't wake up every day and it looks like this. Um, a lot has must to go into making sure the trees are pruned and they need what they um, the nutrients they need, they have. Can you talk about maybe through the year what you have to do uh, to maintain the orchard? Well, I guess it depends where you want to start, but you could start here. Well, in the winter time, uh, we do a lot of sitting, sitting back and uh, analyzing how uh, the uh, health of the different varieties are and uh, what their crop load was and uh, what we have to do differently for the year. So I guess it all starts sort of in the winter time, and uh, we'll get soil tests and stuff done like that, so we know. Uh, how to keep our soil healthy. I mean, I guess you could, if you don't have healthy soil, you're not gonna have healthy trees. But uh, then springtime rolls around and uh, we hope to be done pruning by the springtime. And uh, then uh, the, uh, well, I guess the next thing we do, I mean, we're monitoring pests and uh, keeping all them under control. But uh, the next big thing that uh, comes is uh, thinning apples. And uh, a lot of people don't realize it, but most of these trees will uh, hang almost like grapevines. They'll have that many apples hanging on them. And uh, you can't leave all those on. You have to thin them out so that uh, 
they can they get their share of the nutrients and uh, if you want a nice big apple then uh, you have to uh, adjust your crop load uh, to suit the uh, variety a lot of the times and then uh, so then we uh, well we don't sit back and watch but uh, <laughs> while we're running around doing everything else the trees are growing and uh, the uh, I guess the next step is picking them around uh, we start picking apples uh, end of August and uh, finish up in November and uh, some apples you can come through and uh, pick them all at one time but there's a lot of earlier apples that uh, we go through and pick them three or four maybe even five times and a lot of that depends on the weather too and uh, then once everything's picked uh, the trees go dormant and uh, we start the pruning process and uh, that'll take us until well about now I guess we're just getting that finished up so so you don't just grow apples. I know you grow a lot of different things and they all have a different time that they come into season. So in addition to just the apples, you're running around doing all the other fruits and getting them to market. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about a few of the other fruits that you grow here on the farm? We start with strawberries this year. We have a couple strawberries that we're trying out and then uh, we, uh, we go to apricots come in first and then uh, cherries about the same time. The uh, end of june we're really getting into cherries and sour cherries and then uh about what the middle of july we start getting into some of the early peaches we have white peaches and then we have nectarines and white nectarines we start getting into them and uh by the end of august we're picking plums and uh we have some uh, pluots too that's a cross between an apricot and a plum and uh, oh, that's what we've we, been we saw hit. that on the list and we yeah. wanted to ask you what is that yeah that's been a hit there's a couple different kinds but uh they're crossed between an apricot and a plum and uh they're a little tricky to grow but uh we're trying to get the hang of it and uh then the end of august we're picking pears too we have quite a uh, two or three varieties of pears and uh then uh well yeah the end of august i guess we get into apples too so over yeah over 30 different varieties of apples so so you have quite an extensive um, variety for people to pick from okay well carrie and caleb thank you for bringing us up into the orchard joining me now with carrie is her grandmother fern and her brother callan uh, carrie's going to talk to us a little bit about what it means to be eco apple certified and what that means to the consumer yeah so we talked a lot about ipm um, we are also members of EcoApple, and basically what that means is when we talk about these IPM practices that we're using, um, we can say all we want, but if we're not actually doing it, it doesn't mean anything. So we are actually third-party certified um, by the IPM Institute of North America on an annual basis. They come, they make sure that we're doing what we say we're doing, um, and then we are also members of EcoApple, which is a Massachusetts-based nonprofit organization um, that has really also helped us be in the, on the cutting edge of all of this new research and also with helping us market um, our safer, less pesticide fruit. Are a lot of people, people eco apple certified or is that uh, like kind of the gold standard when buying apples? Um, it, yeah. <laughs> it's the gold standard? Yeah, yeah, not, I think there might have been 13 orchards. In Pennsylvania so or in the Northeast. In the Northeast, so that we are, equal are apple actually one of the furthest south. So that's um, yeah, yeah, most, definitely the gold standard. Yeah. yeah. Well, congratulations about yeah, that. Thank you. We're going to talk to your brother Callan now about the marketing, where you can buy these fantastic gold standard apples, and the many other fruits you have here. Yeah, you know, since we spend so much time growing all this fruit, it's very important to us that we take the final step, and that's why we participate in mostly direct marketing to the consumer. Uh, we do that mostly through farmers markets and if you'd like to find out if we have a farmers market in your area you can just go to Facebook we have Harrisburg some in Bullsburg in uh, Gratz and Lewisburg and we also have ours at the farm here the store all year round so if you go to our Facebook page you can find out a lot about where you can get our really delicious produce there what, what are the hours at the store that's to, through, throughout the winter, it's Tuesday and Friday, Tuesday and Thursday from 9 to 5. And then throughout the summer, it's Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, and then Saturday, 9 to 3. And can people pre-order, you know, in case they're canning or making jelly? 
that can pre-order at a certain amount. Yeah, yeah. It's always great to give us a call and tell us what you're looking for. We'll get your name on it. We'll make sure we get it right to you. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you. Anything else you want to add to the consumer? No, I just think it's really important here. We spend a lot of time growing our stuff. I really, myself, I love to take that final step and see the look of excitement on our customers' faces when we actually get to sell them that nectarine, that fresh peach, that plum. I really like, I really like being a part of that. Okay, so I see uh, we might have the uh, fifth generation coming upon us. Uh, Grandma Fern, can you talk to us about what this means to you to have your grandkids and your great grandkids here and how the farm has progressed? It makes me very happy. I am so happy that they all have helped. And in the future, I can see what they are going to do. And uh, yeah, I know it's going to get very good. That's great. You must have a lot of pride in what they're doing. I do. Okay. Yes, I do. Well, thank you all for being here with me today. This has been wonderful. And uh, this little girl is going to be growing the next generation of eco apples. Is that right? Yes. Um, we're here at Kay Schlegel Fruit Farms. I want to thank the Schlegel family for taking the time out to talk to us today. Anybody interested in that eco apple, uh, this is where you can find it and uh, many, many other fruits, some that we are still learning about. So thank you for joining us for Legislative Report.